So, hope you've all got good memories. It hasn't been that long since these guys spoke. Um, so, who wants to be first cab off the rank with a question this afternoon? Jess. Hey guys, thanks for all of your presentations. Um, I have a question for Warwick. Um, with uh, the fact that we're pushing for grass-fed beef in supermarkets and the trend is to head towards that, is the, how do we offset that? Is that with the pastures that you were talking about? Yeah, it, I think with grass-fed, there's going to, it's not going to be one strategy that's going to solve the problem. It's, it's going to be putting things together in a system that works. Um, so it will be, hopefully there'll be something, some low methane pastures, there might be some supplementation for part or, or of the life cycle of those animals. Um, there might be some genetic solutions, that 1% per year adds up over time. So that's gonna be a key part, I think. Um, but, but again, like we're, we're probably going to be doing something like 30%, not, not 90% of methane reduction. And, and I think that's uh, a realistic target to aim towards rather than expecting to be net zero. Um, most of our farms, particularly where we've got reasonable production, uh, have, don't really have the ability to be net zero at the moment or, or a pathway for that to happen. It's really only our rangeland farms where we've got pretty low stocking rates and, and an ability to um, store a lot of carbon. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, um, Warwick. And what about the uh, use of um, uh, carbon um, to offset uh, your uh, your emissions? Is that that what you're thinking there? Um, it, it, it's absolutely part of the, the story, um, but it's all about doing it in a way that it sort of makes sense. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to put up that graph around uh, equilibrium, the same issue occurs with trees. And so I don't know whether you've heard about the, the Jigsaw Farms, which is one of the first carbon neutral farms down in Victoria. They planted about 30% of their farm to trees. They were carbon neutral for about seven to 10 years. And now they're not carbon neutral anymore because those tree, that tree growth has started to slow. And so all of a sudden it's not actually offsetting their animal emissions. And so, when we're looking at sequestration through either soil or trees, it's only going to offset for a period of time. So it's going to buy us time uh, until, say, some of these other solutions come on board, but it's, we can't keep just taking country out of production and planting trees, or there's a finite amount of soil carbon we can build, and, and, and so we, it, it's, it's not going to be a massive plank in what we're doing when we get into the future. It, it might be a short-term thing to help help us get to that future, though. And now on that, though, what about people who are selling crap for the right Well, you, you sort of can't blame them because there's no price incentive for them to keep them at the moment, but that's if you take a view of what's happening today. Um, if you take a view of where we're going to be in three to five years' time, they those credits might be quite important to their system um, because the price prices differences might be, be better for that side of the business than, that, than what they get for the carbon advantage. The, the other thing to sort of put up is, is it's actually a, a lot riskier than you think and that's why I wanted to put up that, that, that um, graph about how much it can vary over time and, and when you're signing into measuring the carbon over time, you're, you're riding that roller coaster. And um, you, you might get your uphill bit and you'll, you get some real benefits out of that and some big benefits, but then you might then go down and you might not then get any more credits and it depends on what that scheme does as to at the end of that period whether you're liable for that deficit if it's there or not. She was saying that on your website you have some of the issues that people have been having transferring over to EIDs. Um, 
what's some of the challenges that people are having? Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, thanks for the question. So there are a few different issues experienced by a few different farmers and it's really um, dependent on a lot of things. So there's issues down to um, so ear tag retention. So um, there are some issues with, you know, sheep and goats like to stick their head through fences and rip their ear tags out. Um, it's really no different from the electronic to the visual tags because uh, they're basically the same shape, same size, it's, it's the same issue, it's just a little bit more heightened in the EID space as it is a more expensive tag and it does um, impact your individual performance recording if that's something that you're doing. And then um, some of the other issues are, are around the, the learning of the technology and the different, um, how to sort of utilise it. So working out what software package works best for the individual, what type of readers that they want, and um, given that every business is unique and different, that it um, that challenge is going to be unique for everyone in terms of what's going to be best for them. So it's a little difficult to give advice on how to resolve that one, but um, working out your business plans and what what objectives you have to improve, then that's going to help a long way towards working that out. Thank you. And one more bit on that. So say a lamb, you know, drops a tag in the paddock and you're tracking that lamb for weight gain. Do you then need to go get a new tag and then change the ID number on the system? Like, is that to then transfer the data that you've already gained? Yeah, so if, if you're lucky enough to know what tag number was yeah. the one that was lost, then yes, you can just um, replace in the analysed database as well, saying this tag is replacing this tag, um, and then in your own software. But if you're unlucky enough that, that you don't know what tag it was that was missing, then put in a new tag, start over again. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Ash, I've got a question. Um, they're talking about potentially some efficiency gains at, say, the Livestock Marketing Centre with EID and processing of livestock through the sales. Um, what do, is that going to be a, a real thing and would there be any passing on of cost savings to landholders in that process, do you think? Into, at the sale yards? Yeah. Um, so the sale yards won't be charging for scanning of of animals as they go through, but the way that the um, the readers are for sale yards is that it doesn't slow things down, it's just there and then as everything moves through, everything sort of scans as it runs through, so it, the process should be very much the same as it is now, it's not going to interrupt things. Um, and then in terms of producers, when you send animals to the sale yard, the sale yard takes care of the analyzed transfer onto the sale yard and then if you purchase from the sale yard, they'll then do the transfer off as well. So that's, um, I guess, a saving at the producer and that you don't need to to do that. that yep. yep, no worries. Sorry, we just got another question, sorry. Hi guys, Lexi here from Moses and Son. Not so much a question, but I just wanna circle back to the uh, comments around tag retention. And we have done a lot of research in this area and a lot of tag retention is about tag placement at landmarking and understanding that there is a very specific... And, and a lot of these tag companies will provide you with that as a demonstration. They'll show you where they want you to place that tag for maximum retention and making sure that then your landmarking contractor just having that conversation with them in the morning and, and understanding that it's important not just to whack it in anywhere, but to actually place that very expensive little tag neatly in the centre of that ear so that then it's less likely to be pulled out. Yep, and on that same line as well, thank, thanks for your comments. On that same line as well, you've got to be careful with your shearers as well, um, cutting tags, because if they cut through the microchip, then that's another tag that you'll have to replace. So um, as both a stud breeder and a commercial producer, I, as a stud breeder, I completely embrace the use of EIDs. It is absolutely 
um, it's critical for the accurate capturing of data, transferring into the system, exporting, it's great. As a commercial producer, um, I am a little more skeptical given the cost, and I'm wondering why it is that the government made the decision to subsidise all of the equipment, which despite the subsidy is still, they're still expensive, and many, most commercial producers are simply not going to go and buy new auto drafters and panel readers and you know, um, TWR5s, and, because it just doesn't, it's, it's overcapitalization in their operation. What was the driver behind subsidising that equipment and not just subsidising the ear tags as they did in Victoria to support the compulsory use of it into industry? Thanks. Um, so the, the subsidising or discounting of ear tags is a little bit of an unfortunate situation. So what was happening at a national level is the peak body for sheep production, so Sheep Producers Australia, was leading up a group that was looking into a national approach of how to discount the cost of ear tags. And it was going to be um, a long-term solution for every state to access. But unfortunately, um, that didn't sort of come to fruition and they weren't able to come up with a national solution that was suitable. Uh, and that was um, only towards the end of last year that, that they announced that they weren't able to find something. Um, so New South Wales was very supportive of that approach and were really hopeful that they were going to come up with a national solution to reducing tag costs. And since that was announced that it was not possible, New South Wales has been looking into what we can potentially do to help in this space. Um, so do keep your ears open. Something um, I'm hopeful that something will be found. And on that, given whilst I understand the compulsory implementation of tags for lambs born before they leave the property as of next year, but in the light of trying to come up with something to subsidise the cost perhaps or defer the cost, um, the, could it, is there any chance of delaying the implementation of it, particularly for older sheep that are leaving the property? Because we're looking at, as of the 1st of, December, 1st of January 2027, we're looking at a period of potentially up to four years of cast for age ewes leaving the farm and having to have a $2 tag put into their head to send them to the, have their head cut off. Like, that could potentially be happening for up to four years. And I, I just think that is... Um, particularly when you look at a situation like happened at the end of last year when our cast for age ewes were down to um, profoundly low levels, to also then have to put a $2 tag in their ear to send them away, that's sort of rubs salt into the wound a bit. So unfortunately, that's the game we play in, in agriculture and, and a lot of um, other similar industries is that we are at the mercy of, of markets and markets fluctuate. Um, supply and demand is going to change all the time and that's going to affect what, what price we get. Um, it's just, yeah, an, an unfortunate aspect of it. Uh, in terms of delaying, uh, New South Wales has already um, been a leader in sort of extending that timeline to give farmers more time. So instead of going to a, a 1st of January 2025, cut off of everything. We did extend that to 2027, and a few of the other states did um, follow our lead in that and, and go that way as well. So um, that that has, I guess, provided as, as much time as, as we're going to get. And hopefully, I mean, well, all we can do is hope is that the markets um, play in our favor when we need them to. But yes, that will require um, potentially a double up of V tags if they didn't already have an electronic tag. Hopefully I'm right. Um, Alison Southwell, you were talking about um, you've gone and put out a whole bunch of, uh, of lime and before I went racing out of the room to do something else, you, I think you said it might have been wise to incorporate that. Um, have you got anything else that you might add to that with, you know, around um, using and managing lime and incorporation? Um, it gave my husband a great opportunity to buy a new speed tiller the other day. Um, there's going to be certain circumstances where 
Limey, incorporation makes sense and then others where it's not. Um, where we are in Holbrook, topography doesn't allow for it in certain circumstances and the permanency of the pastures also doesn't mean that incorporation is an option. Um, it also comes down to soil type and how that incorporation, what that incorporation is going to do to the structure of that soil and, and your ability to get back on that paddock to, do, to sow something afterwards. So I think it's really a case-by-case -case basis as to whether or not incorporation is a good idea. And we had Jason in here just earlier talking about, you know, we can get lime to move down the profile. Um, it's just we need to learn a little bit more about how to do that efficiently um, and effectively, I think. So I think it's horses for courses, I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah. Any more questions? Speak now or forever, hold your peace. Oh, you got a question? Warwick. I don't know, don't know that it's allowed, is it? Oh. <laughs> yes, it is. I had a curly one the other day, and it was from a producer who didn't have a big background in carbon. So they were working from a reasonably low knowledge base, but I don't think that's unusual. And they said to me, and it was a really... Well, the question they asked me, it was a really interesting one. They said how can we monitor our emissions on farm? Are we going to be always stuck with um, modelling as the way of modelling, as predicting our emissions on farm? And obviously soil carbon testing uh, to a degree, but is there going to be any other ways that we can actually actively monitor emissions on farm so that we can manage it? How's that for a question, all right? Yeah, that's a good one and a reasonable one, I think. <laughs> um, the Net Zero Ag CRC that's just about to kick off in the middle of the year um, has a whole program around uh, low-cost methane sensors. Um, and that's sort of one of those things if you can't measure it, you can't manage it type approaches. So we currently do sort of bottom-up accounting based on that those intake relationships that I put up in my presentation, but um, we don't know when those rules aren't met in in the in the in the paddock because we we sort of don't have enough information to because very little methane has actually been measured in the paddock uh, under graze commercial graze situations. So um, I actually think that's going to be an important approach into the future um, with the advances in sort of machine learning type techniques now we can take really vast and varied data sets and meld them together um, to produce outcomes as well um, and so I think that going forward our our modeling approaches to this will be more sophisticated based on data uh, real that's been collected in the field and and hopefully will give greater opportunity to pr predict um, methane levels that's that's actually really occurring rather than often really, really simple approaches that we use and, and soil carbon is, is a very similar situation. So, yeah, I think there is opportunity. Um, so I'm just wondering, how do you prove that at the point of sale? Um, you, that's one of the challenges. And, and this is one of the challenges in this whole carbon market space at the moment is it's, it's evolving. Um, there's not, sometimes there's not a lot of data behind a lot of this stuff. And, we're, we're, and we can't sort of wait to run it for 10 or 15 years to get the confidence that it's going to work. So... Um, I think that's going to be a really, really challenging situation. So, uh, so there hasn't been any thought given to, say, a centralised body who will regulate and, say, issue an annual certificate to a producer so that when you send your stock to market, you can say, yes, these are the measures oh, that I've undertaken. Um, the accounting is regulated, but um, and, and the accounting all flows down from international standards. So, so all the IPCC standards... Um, they flow down to how we do our national accounts and if we can improve those international standards when we get local data that is better than 
or, or locally adapted, say nitrous oxide emissions um, is one, uh, emissions factors. Um, and so we, we build that in, but when you look at how that's done, that accounting's done on a seasonal basis or something where a farmer needs to make a decision on a daily basis about what they're doing. And so there's a level of detail between that accounting, which is sort of top down, to management needs that are, that are bottom up, where we, we know we can get much more efficiency with better data now, sort of thing. And so I don't think the business case sort of needs to um, be there. We just need to make sure that that bottom up approach with management actually aligns with the accounting that is, is coming the other way, which absolutely can do. And when, when, when equations have been developed this way, they're, they're actually doing it both ways. So we can use it for national accounts and we can use it for um, infield management. And the integrated supplement measurement is, is one where this is occurring at the moment. So it'll be more an industry-wide um, consideration as opposed to a per-producer consideration? The way producers will probably interact with this is the, there'll be a level in the middle, which is sort of your farm software providers, your, the people who are going to be contracted by the supply chain to verify the emissions on a farm. And so that will start reasonably simply with the tools we have, but there's a lot of opportunity to build in more detailed approaches to that because we've got data. We've got plenty, like, and, and we'll have more and more data as we go forward, um, particularly our farm platforms and all the other sources that we've got individually, EID tags as, as an example, um, that we can then tap into to look for efficiency and look for improved sort of carbon outcomes. Right, because I was curious, I mean, my original question was going to be about the scope three emissions. Yep. So if I source fertiliser, surely the onus is on the producer of the fertiliser to make sure that they have a neutral footprint, that I shouldn't be wearing, like, the responsibility of what they've produced. So do I ask the supplier to give me something to prove that they have achieved a certain degree of neutrality, or...? Um, Yep, at, at the moment, it's generic, the, the, the footprint that you, you're given an emissions factor for that, but you can replace that emissions factor if you've got data to show that it's lower. So I think what you're saying is an absolute right question that people should be asking in the future, because this is exactly what the supply chain is doing to farmers. They're asking them to say, um, show me your number so that I can choose the most efficient livestock producers. So as a producer, if you're trying to reduce your number as much as you can, you should be looking and saying, well, where can I get lower emissions? And, and some of those uh, emissions factors uh, for things like glyphosate are, are based on really old data. So it, wouldn't, it would be in the company's interest to show that that factor is actually lower um, for their production system. Um, and, and it would benefit the people who are buying it and it would probably benefit them as well. No worries. I think we might wrap that up if we can. We're just uh, finishing off. So um, a really interesting and ongoing discussion, that one. And um, we just might thank our speakers and we'll uh, head on to our next speaker.